It is strange, my Theseus, what these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such exceeding brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehends more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lover, the lunatic, and the poet are of imagination, all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is, the madman. The, the lover sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the minds of things unknown, gives them to sheep, and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination, that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easily is a bush supposed to bear. But through all the story of the night told over, and all the minds transfigured so together, it seems more witnesses than fancy's images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us. Let us walk in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear away the long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are at hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call Phil Street. Here, mighty Theseus. Say, what abridgment have you for this evening? How shall we beguile the lazy time, if not with some delight? There is a brief how many sports are right. Make choice of which your highness will see first. The battle with the centaurs, to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. <laughs> well, none of that that I have told my love and glory of my kinsman Hercules. The ride of the tipsy bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. That is an old device, and it was played when I from Thebes came less to conquer. The thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning, late deceased in beggary. That is some satire, keen and, keen and critical, not sorting for a nuptial ceremony. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical? Tedious and brief? That is, hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play. But by ten words, my lord, it is too long. Which makes it tedious. For in all the play there is not one word apt, one player fitted. And tragical, my noble lord, it is. For Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which, I must confess, when I saw rehearse, made mine eyes water. But more merry tears, the passion of loud laughter never shed. And what are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens, who never toiled in their minds until now, but now have worked their unbreathed memories for this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it through, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intent, as stretched and conned with cruel pain, to do you service. Never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, ladies. I will not see wretchedness overcharged, and duty in his service perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He said they can do nothing in this kind. The kind are we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake. Continue. And what poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great clerks have proposed to greet me with premeditated welcomes. Where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practice accents in, a, in their fears, and in conclusion, dumbly broke off. And in the modesty of fearful duty, I read as much as from the rattled tongues of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, in least speak most to my capacity. So please, your grace, the prologue is addressed. <coughs> if we offend, it is with our good will that you think we should come not to offend, but with that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then we come, 
but in despite. We do not come as minded con to contest you, our true intent is. For your delight, we are not here. That you should here repent you, the actors are at hand, and by their show, you are to know all that there is to know. This fellow doth not stand upon points. He hath read his prologue like a rough colt. He knows not the stop, a good moral, but it is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, he hath played upon his prologue like a child upon a recorder, a sound, but not in government. His speech was like a tangled chain, nothing impaired, but all distorted. Who is next? Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady, Thisbe, is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chink. They are content to whisper, at which let no man wonder. This man, with lanthorn, dog, and bush of thorn, presenteth moonshine, for if you would know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Ninus' tomb there, there to woo. This man, with which lie in height by name, the trusty Thisbe coming first by night did scare away, or rather did affright. And as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty 